Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is the seventh lecture in our winter Northwest Geriatrics Worst Force Enhancement Center Geriatric Healthcare Lecture Series. Um, my name is Barbara Cochran, and I am the Associate Director for the Northwest GWEC. Um, the mission of the center is to optimize primary care of older adults, emphasis on primary care. And our vision is to engage families, caregivers, age and dementia friendly health systems, primary care providers and their communities to support older adult health and well-being. And one of our objectives really builds on that age-friendly systems um, to transform clinical environments to be integrated um, age-friendly systems that practice the four M's. Um, and the four M's are include what matters, in other words, what is important to the patient, what are the older adults' preferences, medications to really consider medications carefully um, and to ensure that they don't interfere with what matters or interfere with mobility and mentation across settings of care. Uh, the third M is mentation to prevent, identify, treat, and manage dementia, depression, and delirium across the settings. And then mobility to ensure that older adults can move safely um, every day in order to maintain function and do what matters. So the goal of the four M's and age-friendly systems is that you address each of these four M's each time that you um, have an encounter with an older adult. This is the winter 2020 lecture schedule and you'll see a couple of lectures in red and that's because we've had a, a little bit of a shift in our schedule. So today's lecture, as I gave you a hint about last week, is going to be on women's health. And the lecture that was originally scheduled for today on the aging eye will be um, in two weeks on March 3rd. Otherwise, the lecture series stays the same and we have three more lectures after today. And then um, we have our spring 2020, um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias schedule. This is um, the schedule for that series. Um, and I'm gonna stay on here for a little bit, but just remind you that our goal is to address the four M's within each of these lectures, but grant, you know, recognizing that particularly for the ADRD series, um, mentation and what matters are going to be two of the key M's addressed in these um, lectures. So we will have 10 weeks starting March 31st with um, an update um, and sort of the core lecture on dementia and concluding on June 2nd with a lecture on cognitive assessment in primary care. So we look forward to you joining us if you're able uh, during that lecture series. And you should contact your site coordinators um, to register for that and get set up. Some additional logistics um, is that um, I'll be monitoring, I'll be doing a little bit of multitasking today and monitoring the Zoom chat. During my presentations, if there's um, technical issues, um, and please let me know if you're not hearing sound. I see somebody saying, should we hear sound yet? I'm hoping that um, has resolved because you should be hearing sound at this point. Um, so please, if you have technical issues, um, go ahead and put something in the chat. At the last 15 minutes of the lecture, I'll open up to questions. And if you could put your questions within the chat box, that would be great as well. In particular, maybe avoiding the Q&A box because I'll be multitasking and a little bit crazy. <laughs> Um, a reminder that you should be completing a profile form just once for the series. Uh, a sign in and attendance form, particularly if you want continuing education contact hours, and that would be for each lecture attended. And then an evaluation form, please, please, please. Um, we use these, this information to give feedback to our presenters as well as to get some ideas about high priority topics for the next series please check with your site coordinator about how you can access these forms. Some of you will be getting them in hard copy and others will be giving, getting links to a survey monkey for completing those forms. 
Post lecture, you can get continuing education contact hours up to 15 um, credits and you should talk with your site coordinator um, about that. We will have additional information towards the end of the series, which is when you would register. There is a slight fee for the contact hours through UW Continuing Nursing Education, which also covers social workers, counselors, psychologists, and you can get um, a certificate um, that you can use if you need so for um, your work or other kinds of documentation. Um, the recordings are also posted online at nwgwec.org, and that's usually within about 48 hours after the live lecture. Um, and if you go there, um, feel free to check out, we have over 90 archive lectures from past series. However, there are no continuing education contact hours for that site. The lectures are available for free. If you do want to get continuing education contact hours for past lecture series, you can go to uwcne.org and um, sign up for one of those series. There is a small fee, uh, but you can um, get continuing education credit and documentation um, for past series. Okay, so today I um, scrambled a bit unexpectedly to prepare uh, the lecture that was planned in a couple of weeks on older women's health. And just to let you know, um, my background has been in working within women's health and particularly older women's health for about the last 30 years. Um, my research has been in, in the distant past, primarily cardiovascular disease and women's um, uh, cardiac health. But I have also, for since about 1992, been with the Coordinating Center for the Women's Health Initiative, which is a large, large national study of over um, 167,000 women um, postmenopausal who have now been followed for over 25 years. They're turning 100 and um, we're still following them. But this was the study, some of you may know, that um, had three clinical trials up through 2005. And um, it seems to get the most press in the past for releasing the results about hormone therapy in older women and the, the um, findings that although there was um, strong thought and research that would indicate hormones would protect against cardiovascular disease. The results of the study um, seem to um, show something different, and I'll get into some of that in a, in a few minutes. Okay, so I have no disclosures. Um, an overview for this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of older women's lives, my work in nursing, in cardiovascular nursing with the Women's Health Initiative has also come, I think, from, you might say, from a personal feminist bent, and I view um, the context of women's health, um, lives and their um, psychosocial uh, lives as important as their biological lives. I'm going to talk a bit about chronic conditions, particularly how they are distinct for women, um, and a little bit about hormones. I can't resist that given the um, hormone study that I was involved with and its impact on women's health um, going forward. We'll talk a little bit about clinical encounters and what you might want to consider when you're connecting with an older woman, and then um, lifestyle and health promotion considerations. And I just want to mention that this um, sort of collage is actually one that we've used in the WHI. I love seeing it because these are women um, who have been a part of the WHI across the nation. Um, many of them participated in recruitment videos and other kinds of informed consent videos. And, um, and so it's like seeing old friends um, when I see that collage. So as we think about context of um, women's lives, you probably know that the percentage of females by age group in um, 65 um, through uh, eight older ages is really a much higher percentage of women than men. Women have increased um, uh, longevity compared to men. And, um, and so you can see that even though the um, distinctions between the percentages of females 
um, has changed over time and is expected to change over time, that there's maybe not as much of a distinction, particularly as we look at the oldest old or women age 85 and over, um, we have a much higher percentage of older women um, that we're working with than older men. Living arrangements of the population 65 and older sort of follows this um, same theme in that when you take a look at the very light gray portion of these bars, this uh, identifies people who are living alone. We still in our society um, see that um, men tend to marry women younger than them and so as, um, and given women's longer lifespan, when women get older, more of them are without spouses and living alone. And um, we see that across racial ethnic groups, um, that the higher percentage of people living alone uh, is um, for women as opposed to men. Many older women on Medicare are experiencing issues of poverty. And so this um, diagram shows that as we look at women 65 and over by age groups, young, old, um, through oldest old, um, a, higher per a high percentage of um, the women are, um, have incomes below 10,000. And we also see that um, comparison when we look at racial ethnic groups in that we have a higher percentage of African American and Latina women who are um, have incomes below 10,000. So this sets a context for older women's lives in that they are um, many more of them are living alone than older men and many more of them are experiencing issues of poverty. Given that, um, those of you working um, in the community with older women know that um, Medicaid is an important consideration for people who have lower incomes and women comprise the majority of older adults who are on Medicaid. Um, we see the, in the blue, the percentage of men compared to in the orange, the percentage of women, particularly as we look at 85 and older, a much higher percentage of older adults are uh, on Medicaid are women. Women also comprise the majority of Medicare enrollees. Now part of that is because there are more older women and so they are going to comprise the majority of Medicare enrollees, but it's important consideration. Um, I note in our chat that people, somebody has identified having issues with cutting in and out. Um, let me know if others are having those issues. If not, I would recommend that you sort of log out and log back in to see if that helps. Okay, so um, another thing to consider with older women and the fact that um, they, are, uh, they have a longer lifespan, that they're living alone, um, that they are um, experiencing income issues, is that um, the, they also have limitations that predispose them to needing long-term care. So if we look at um, the bars, the orange and the sort of yellowish bars on the left, you see that a much higher percentage of women have limitations in activities of daily living, limitations in instrumental activities of daily living, and cognitive and mental um, impairments. We also see if we look at um, women specifically by age that they have, um, as they get older, um, conditions that predispose them to needing long-term care. Um, broken hips, incontinence, limitations in ADLs and IADLs, and cognitive and mental impairment. These are all factors that research has shown them, predis shown us predisposes um, people to needing long-term care. And so the data um, sort of confirms this, that most of the recipients of long-term care services and supports are women, not just those in nursing homes or skilled nursing facilities, but also those who are um, receiving home health services. Again, when we think about these percentage, keep in mind that there's more older women. And so granted, they're going to have a higher percentage, but it is important 
to understand that the contexts of their lives are different, um, particularly if they're living alone or not having the spousal caregivers that we might see more often for men. Women have multiple roles and relationships in their lives and that doesn't change, but it shifts slightly as they get older. So they may be without a spouse or an intimate partner as they get older. Children are still involved in their lives and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Not just that they're looking to their children to care for them, but many of them are caring for children. Um, some of them are connecting again with siblings and we see more and more sort of congregate um, housing experiences for um, uh, women who are perhaps living with or helping to care for siblings. Um, they set up friendship ne networks and become what sometimes is described as fictive kin or people who are so close and, and providing each other with the kinds of support that is um, similar as though they were family. And all of those roles and relationships show some shifts as um, women get older. The caregiving role is a big consideration in women's life. And what we see both in the United States and across the world is that caregiving roles reflect trends in aging in that because we've now, we now are seeing declining fertility rates, um, there are not as many children to help and, and be there for older adults. Um, we see increased life expectancy, so they're living longer and needing um, services and support. And family members are moving out of the towns and cities and villages, um, both globally as well as in the United States to take jobs. And so we have um, much more of a, a consideration related to long distance caregiving. So this diagram here is just sort of demonstrating, although the last one shows a man lifting, and this is a focus on women, you can see that there are much fewer people to take care of the older adults. And so we end up in the situation where older women are often caring for older parents at the same time that they're caring for their children and maybe even their grandchildren. This um, diagram shows the percentage of caregivers who are providing assistance by the type of assistance as well as sex. And I wanted you to pay attention to the sort of light um, colored bars, which shows the percentage of women. 52% um, are providing assistance for self-care or personal care. 69% are providing assistance for mobility. 86% for transportation, and 58% for medical or health care, which can be um, as simple as doing dressing changes, but also can be as profound as all sorts of health care um, uh, procedures and um, issues. This just documents the fact that um, the number of grandparents who are responsible for their own grandchildren, as I mentioned, seems to be happening in um, the United States now. And um, in particular, we see in this orange bar that um, that's the number, that's the um, represents people 60 years and over, um, that that's increasing over time. Um, so that these are people who um, are older women, um, caregivers who are largely older women, and they are caring for grandchildren in households where there are no parents and in the household. Um, whereas we see that um, uh, folks uh, 30 to 59 caregivers, the rate is declining. Caregiving can take a toll on health, particularly if they're sandwiched um, in between caring for um, spouses, parents, themselves, and younger folks. So um, women can find their health worsening, can lead to other health problems, including depression or social isolation for the caregiver, which um, can be, um, lead to stress, some physical strains, 
um, lack of self-care, including not seeking um, health care for themselves. One of the things I did my dissertation research on women post um, myocardial infarction, and it was really, I followed them for about um, six weeks or more after they were discharged from the hospital, but um, also um, did qualitative work with them while they were in the hospital. And one of the interesting things that came out of that work was that women really viewed um, a need to become more independent when they uh, were discharged from the hospital, and yet they defined independence for themselves as being able to provide services and supports for others. And so they were very, very anxious um, and, and sometimes taking on activities and responsibilities um, and managing stress that perhaps other family members in other households might take on, but because they were um, wanting to reestablish their independence, which is to be able to give care, um, they were doing probably a bit more than they should have um, post-MI. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about health conditions and concerns that we see in older women. This is a diagram, um, a chart that you've seen before, but it just documents the percentage of men and women who have selected chronic health conditions. And um, although we see a lower percentage of um, women with heart disease on here, this is for um, people age 65 and older, and we do know that women have a slightly delayed manifestation of heart disease than we see in men. Um, in the other conditions, we see about similar percentages or even higher percentages for women in terms, particularly um, if we look at some of the conditions like arthritis, asthma, hypertension. Uh, there's been a, a series of studies that the American Heart Association has done that I find kind of interesting. Um, they started back in 1997 asking women what they thought was the leading cause of death in women. And you can see here that back in 1997, almost half of women viewed cancer as the leading cause of death, um, whereas cardiovascular disease was about 30%. Um, a lot of public information campaigns followed this finding because the research would say that um, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death, particularly in older women. And so in 2013, um, we saw kind of a shift in this that um, more uh, people, more women did view cardiovascular disease as a leading cause of death. Um, but this kind of shows you how those percentages actually um, fall out. This was back in 2009, these statistics. Um, and so uh, this is February. It's kind of a coincidence that it's, you know, um, Go Red for Women Month, which is the Heart Associations and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute's campaign to I mean, increase awareness about <clears throat> cardiovascular disease in women. So um, it's um, hopefully you'll see even more public service campaigns. And in fact, just within the last several days, I saw a big news article that was reviewing um, and um, reconfirming some of the findings about heart disease in women and how um, women manifest heart disease a little bit differently. So I'm gonna get into that. I think it's very important, not just for those in primary care, but those who are, um, living with and working with older women to be aware of these. Um, so the trends in awareness that heart disease is a leading cause of women has um, shifted over time. People are becoming more aware, but you'll notice that the public information campaigns are perhaps having a much greater impact on white women, and there's still a need to increase awareness in racial ethnic minority women about heart disease being um, a concern. If we think about hypertension, one of the big risk factors for cardiovascular disease, 32 to 43% of women overall in the United States have hypertension. And after age 55, women are more likely than men to develop high blood pressure. Death from coronary heart disease, um, 
progresses increasingly and, and essentially linearly as blood pressure increases, such that for about every 20 millimeters of mercury systolic or 10 millimeters of mercury diastolic increase in blood pressure, we see doubling of the risk of death from stroke, heart disease, or other vascular diseases. This um, diagram just shows um, the uncontrolled blood pressure among those with hypertension. In other words, they're not getting good control. Hypertension's been documented. And we do see in women 65 and older a much higher percentage compared to younger women and compared to um, men. Coronary heart disease. Um, is the leading cause of death in women overall. Half of coronary heart disease deaths each year in women. And I don't think people are necessarily aware of that, but in part because women are living longer um, and men, older men have potentially already died from heart disease. We see half of deaths each year um, in women. And the prognosis for um, coronary heart disease may be worse for women than for men. In part, they may delay obtaining um, a diagnosis and treatment of symptoms. We're seeing that the medical community is responding a lot more um, aggressively. But for example, when I was doing my dissertation and interviewing women, there were like four or five who had stories to tell me. And this was a qualitative study, so only 16 women, but four or five of them had stories to tell about repeatedly going to the healthcare provider to, um, um, with symptoms that were treated with antacids or sending home or, or something like that, only to, for things to worsen and worsen um, until they got a little bit more dire. Uh, women are often under prescribed discharge medications when, um, they uh, go home from uh, treatment uh, hospitalization for coronary heart disease. And it's only been within the last maybe 15 or 20 years that we are seeing um, more treatments being offered to women um, than we have in the past. Part of that was some of these treatments um, like the artificial heart and that sort of thing um, were developed for men and so the, so the um, Technology and the equipment just wasn't suitable for women's smaller chests. One of the things I'm always telling my students is think about the implications for that. It's not just helpful for women for us to start studying these kinds of interventions um, in women, but it's also helpful for men who have smaller chests and um, can do better with this um, kind of approach. Female um, um, patients who have myocardial infarction or a heart attack are generally about 10 years older than men. They have mo more comorbid conditions, um, more risk factors. But interestingly, women present more often with angina than myocardial infarction as sort of their first manifestation of coronary heart disease. So what's an MI really like for women? And this is the article that I saw a couple of days ago, so you might want to Google the news because there's been some recent stuff, in part because it's Go Red for Women Month and it's Valentine's and everybody's thinking about hearts. But um, an, an interesting thing is that more women who have an MI present without chest pain than men. In fact, 42% um, of women um, present without chest pain compared to 30.7% of men. Um, now chest discomfort or pain is the most common symptom in both men or women, but we see more women having vague symptoms, symptoms that maybe intensify over time. They may come and go. They may start even a month before the MA is, MI is finally diagnosed. And in part, that might be because um, they have struggled a bit to um, have their symptoms sort of attended to. Women are more likely than men to have nonspecific symptoms like fatigue, um, some shortness of breath, weakness, a sense of danger or doom. When I interviewed the women in my study and I asked them about the symptoms that they had, um, one of the women told me she never had chest discomfort. It just felt like somebody was pulling her belly button from the inside out. Another woman said she just got up and, and started walking across the room. And then she said, and that's all she wrote. She was gone. She, um, 
passed out. Another woman was having chest discomfort, went to the ER and um, was given antacids and went home. And it wasn't until her husband um, really pushed her to go back to the ER that she finally got treatment. And by that time, um, she was in very dire straits and needed a lot more interventional work. She just didn't want to be embarrassed. That situation is much, much better. Those women had had their MIs back in the um, mid 80s, early 90s. Um, we're paying a much more attention. But even in primary care, if um, you are um, connecting with a woman who is identifying some vague symptoms, um, don't be too ready to pass those on. Um, uh, think about that it could be uh, symptoms of an NMI and might need to be evaluated. Strokes occur more in men than women, but women more, are more likely to die from them, and hypertension is the leading risk for stroke. The death rate is um, about 79.8% um, uh, higher for African American than ca Caucasian women, and it's a leading cause of disability in older women and older men. Diabetes is interesting. It affects about 9.2% of all US women 18 and over. Um, about 2.5% have undiagnosed diabetes. Um, the risk for ketoacidosis is greater in women than in men, and I don't know if you knew that. Um, and we see increased rates of diabetes in racial ethnic minority women than in white women. But the thing to keep in mind with older women, particularly those who are diagnosed with um, diabetes um, and in, at older ages, is that that diagnosis um, brings about three to seven times the risk of coronary heart disease and MI as women without diabetes, and about two to four times the risk of stroke. And in fact, um, invariably, when I hear about a younger woman who's had a heart attack, I say, I bet she had diabetes, and that's what I find out. Diabetes really confers a risk for coronary heart disease and MI that's sort of similar to a men, and it brings a risk of coronary heart disease much more so than in men. Women with diabetes are more likely to die from MI and are more likely to have a recurrent MI. So if you're seeing a woman with diabetes, it is really important to address other cardiovascular risk factors and to evaluate um, coronary heart disease history in these women. Another thing to keep in mind is that a history of gestational diabetes um, also brings a, a greater chance of developing type two diabetes later in life. And so it's another um, opportunity to address cardiovascular risk factors um, in older women. The top three cancer diagnoses in women are breast, lung, and colorectal cancer. These are all what you would call age-related cancers. You see higher percentages in older women, um, even though age isn't necessarily the cause. Um, but you can see that their chance of being diagnosed, for example, with breast cancer definitely increases as um, a woman gets older. Um, and a woman's risk of breast cancer is one in eight um, ever. Lung cancer will kill over 63,220 American women this year, um, and that's more than what we might see for breast and ovarian cancer combined. Um, it's the leading cause of cancer death in women, um, and women seem to have a less of a decline in mortality since 1990 than men. In other words, um, we're seeing um, we're seeing some decline in women, but it is not as great of a decline. So that makes us look at um, whether it's being um, diagnosed early enough, whether the treatments are being um, um, identified that are appropriate for women um, to be able to address this. Risk markedly increases with smoking or passive smoking or asbestos exposure. And then colorectal cancer strikes women nearly as often as men. Um, there are, are about almost 70,000 new diagnoses in women um, estimated for 2020, um, much more so in men. But if you look at the relative percentages, again, because there's more older women, there's not that much difference. You had a great lecture on osteoporosis earlier, so I'm not going to go into um, this focus very much, but I do want to remind you that 
there are an estimated 10.2 million people in the US with osteoporosis, 8.2 million of those are women. Um, there are um, an additional 27.3 million women who have low bone mass, um, and a, nearly half of women 50 years and older are going to experience an osteoporosis related fracture in their lifetime. So this is a very important consideration when working with older women. Osteoarthritis is present in 50 to 90% of older adults. It's one of the reasons I'm sitting here instead of standing up. Um, it's a major cause of knee and hip and back pain in older adults. And it really can develop in any joint that suffered injury um, or um, experienced other types of arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis. The hallmark is cartilage degeneration. Um, the ulceration and the problems can begin somewhat superficially, but it gradually extends into the deeper layers and um, there's um, a real need to evaluate um, both activity as well as other kinds of intervention for osteoarthritis. Because we want these people to keep moving. This um, documents a percentage of Medicare enrollees who are unable to perform certain physical functions by age. And if we look at men and women, we can see that um, those indications that I had mentioned earlier, where we see much more um, functional decline or um, impact on activities of daily living in older women. In other words, um, stooping or kneeling, reaching over their head, um, walking, lifting, um, any of these five kinds of conditions, we see a higher percentage in older women than older men. And this is comparing the lighter bars are in 1991 compared to 2009. We're getting a little bit better in um, managing these kinds of conditions and identifying opportunities for um, intervention. I'm going to go back to my dissertation and say one of the things I really celebrate is the increased focus on physical activity that we now see. When I was interviewing women back in the 80s and early 90s, um, most of the women that I interviewed, as well as the ones that I worked with in coronary care, were not being encouraged to, to um, take part in cardiac rehabilitation. And when you think about, particularly back then, the gym life for um, older women was not something that they were familiar with. Now we have fitness centers, they have specialized um, classes and opportunities for both older men and older women, and um, things are looking much, much better. But uh, we still have a long way to go to help people recognize that um, staying active is important, and there are multiple venues for doing that. Um, we may have talked in the past, but, and you may have um, this kind of um, opportunity in, where you live as well. One of the cool things that they have here in Seattle is um, what's known as the Woodland Park Zoo Walkers. And the Zoo Walkers um, are, show up at the zoo before it opens. I used to be on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. And um, there's a docent there who often takes them through. But it's it's like getting some exercise. They'll um, often do blood pressures and, and have health talks and that sort of thing. But it's different from a gym. It's a social um, thing. It's interesting. And, um, and it's a way to keep people moving and engaged um, in their communities. So just to mention the outcomes of um, osteoporosis and even osteoarthritis um, is the concerns that we have about falls in older adults. 10 to 15% of falls result in some sort of fracture and the risks are increased with age, they're increased for women, they're increased for people who have a history of falls, um, cognitive impairment, this all kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, lower extremity weakness, which we see more in older adults, that sort of muscle weakness of sarcopenia, balance problems, psychotropic um, medications, arthritis, history of stroke, orthostatic hypotension, and one of the biggest risk factors for falls is a fear of falling. So that's something to keep in mind. So when um, you're interacting with an older woman, ask them about falls during the past year. 
um, check out um, their balance and their gait to um, understand what their risk for a single fall might be. And if they've had recurrent falls or gait or balance disturbances, um, get a more complete medical history, physical exam, um, cognitive and functional assessment, and determine multifactorial falls risk. And you got some information from um, Susan Ott about um, doing these kinds of assessments. Preventing falls, I show this just because I like this photo, I think. Um, but preventing falls exercise is so key. Vitamin D supplementation, um, because vitamin D can, um, deficiencies can be um, associated with muscle weakness. Um, Deprescribing psychotropic medications, and then doing a home health, um, um, a home hazard assessment. This is just a diagram. When we've done health fairs here in Seattle, um, I've sat at the table for older adults and have them and their family members sort of take a look and identify all of the factors in this photo that are um, increasing risk for falls and um, other kinds of problems. And so I'm hoping you can see some of those issues as well, loose cords, loose rugs, um, things that are um, in, in a, a person's way, um, going, trying to go upstairs when there's things on the stairs, all of that. Um, one of the things that we do in nursing, I don't know um, in your area or in your programs, but um, doing a fall risk assessment is a great way for students to sort of start interacting with older adults and learning about older adults' lives. Cognitive impairment um, is mild cognitive impairment in, um, in particular is um, similar in women in, and in men, but there are increased cases of Alzheimer's in women compared to men. Um, this is probably, again, because women live longer, um, but that, their risk dramatically um, increases with age. And this just shows for men and women um, the percentage of non-nursing home population, um, 65 and over with dementia. And you do see, particularly as we get older, um, 75 and over, a higher percentage of um, women compared to the percentage of men who um, are diagnosed with dementia. I also want to mention another um, uh, condition that we see in women, we also see this in men, but it doesn't seem to um, come out as much. And, and I sort of in distress that the, um, similar to how heart disease communications and health information seems to be focused, at least in the past on men, um, the focus on urinary incontinence is really for women when men experience it too. But this is a talk about women. And so I'm gonna mention that 30 to 40% of young and middle age, um, Women experience urinary incontinence, 30 to 50% of older women. Um, it is more common in older women than in men. Um, and we see much higher rates in institutions, in part because urinary incontinence and issues and concerns and problems often are one of the reasons that um, people um, move into institutions because um, of the need for care. So rates are about 60 to 70% in long-term care. And urinary incontinence can be associated with functional and quality of life concerns, falls and social isolation as people stay in their homes um, rather than go out into the world. Um, and the falls is a huge issue because um, they're getting up potentially in the middle of the night and, um, and then um, having um, issues. The effects of incontinence on quality of life um, can be very profound. Emotional functioning, physical functioning, um, social socialization, intimacy and sexuality can be a big issue. Um, it can be a burden for family members um, who are trying to support um, the older woman in their family, and yet it, uh, the woman is perhaps not necessarily wanting family member help. I remember when my grandfather was in the hospital and was having issues with um, urinary incontinence. And, um, and even though I was a nurse, he wanted me out of the room whenever he needed help. And that happens um, even more profoundly for older women who are experiencing concerns about urinary incontinence. There are occupational effects of incontinence because of the need to get to the bathroom and, and um, 
have products and um, the ability to address incontinence issue. There are health effects, um, skin breakdowns and falls, and then economic because of the cost of just the day-to-day -day supplies that are needed, as well as perhaps um, medication and um, surgical management. So urinary incontinence is um, a big issue, and um, I'm hoping that we're going to see much more opportunities um, like some of the um, ads that we see on TV now that make it seem a little bit more normative um, and, and yet also help people to understand that urinary incontinence is not a normal aspect of aging and so um, they should be seeing their healthcare professional if they um, are experiencing these problems. Um, another consideration that we see in older adults and, you know, these things like falls and urinary incontinence and even sexuality, um, one of the things we battle when, in gerontology is the expectation that this just happens when a person gets older, um, rather than that there might be things that can be done to help and that it shouldn't be a normal part of aging. There are some factors that can affect sexual response in older women, menopausal changes, there's cultural expectations and norms, relationship problems. One of the biggest um, factors that predicts um, a decline in sexual acti activity in women is the lack of a partner. Um, previous sexual experiences may impact uh, a woman's sexuality, chronic illnesses, and then depression but sexuality still remains important for older women, um, even without a partner. And so this is a topic that um, a, a sympathetic and supportive um, provider uh, should raise with um, women. Dyspareunia or um, pain on intercourse and decreased libido are some of the problems that we see. These may be due to organic or psychological factors perhaps even a combination of the two. Um, the most common cause of pain with intercourse is atrophic vaginitis that's due to estrogen deficiency. And even though the results, which I'll talk about in a minute, or the hormone trials would say, we need to be cautious about the use of hormone in older women, topical estrogen therapy can still be a treatment of choice for addressing atrophic vaginitis or the drying and thinning of the vaginal walls, um, which is a major, can be a major cause of um, intercourse related pain for older women. Okay, so I've been talking about the Women's Health Initiative. Um, these were um, uh, the headlines in magazines uh, in the country in about 2004 when the results of the Women's Health Initiative, 2002, when the results, um, the first results came out. And I think it's hilarious <laughs> that, you know, there were all of these news articles and stuff, but the biggest issue was that Star Magazine was telling us how the hormone therapy terror was hitting Hollywood and what a horrible thing that was um, for our, our um, celebrities. So the Women's Health Initiative hormone trials involved um, about 68,000 women who were um, either randomized to receive um, estrogen plus progestin if they had a uterus. You may know that um, if a woman has a uterus, then progestin is needed to protect against um, endometrial cancer or estrogen alone for women who um, did not had a have a uterus um, through because of hysterectomy. And um, I'm just going to refer you to the JAMA article. This article actually came out after the initial results in 2002 for the estrogen plus progestin trial, 2004 for the estrogen alone trial. Both of those trials were stopped early because we found out that there were increased risks related to benefits um, of hormone therapy in contrast to what everyone thought was going to be the case. Um, the hormones were being um, tested to see whether they could be used to prevent cardiovascular disease. There had been a lot of longitudinal cohort studies, observational studies that would indicate that um, cardiovascular disease decreases um, in women who had been taking hormone therapy. Um, and so we all sort of had a mindset that this study was going to prove 
that. And instead, what it showed was that hormone therapy um, actually increased some of the risks. And this article took a look at women um, during as well as after stopping their hormones to see the risks on various endpoints, coronary heart disease, breast cancer, stroke, pulmonary embolus, colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, hip fractures, and then all-cause mortality, and a global index that sort of evaluated risks versus benefits. Um, and you can see that um, things kind of changed a little bit when we went from the intervention phase to the post-intervention phase. Um, but the lesson to be learned from these studies was that the thought that hormones were going to be the magic bullet for um, older women for chronic disease prevention was not supported. Um, it's not a fountain of youth, and it was associated with an increase of risk of stroke, venous thrombosis, gallstones, urinary incontinence, estrogen progestin was associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, and so the conclusion from the um, Women's Health Initiative and other studies that have come since then is that menopausal hormone therapy is a reasonable option for short-term management of moderate to severe menopausal symptoms in younger women, but it probably should be prescribed at the lowest dose possible and for the shortest duration possible, and primarily in women um, in the early postmenopausal years as opposed to the later um, postmenopausal years. Uh, there is um, a high risk of coronary heart disease and other um, outcomes if it's prescribed for older women. And some of you may notice that I'm talking about menopausal hormone therapy rather than what we used to refer to as hormone replacement therapy because it's no longer viewed that replacing hormones is therapeutic for older women. Um, and, and others of you may be wondering why I'm bringing this up because women 65 and older are all postmenopausal. They're, you know, the average age of menopause is in their 50s, but the Women's Health Initiative was actually initiated because of a thought that women should be on hormones for the rest of their lives to protect themselves against coronary heart disease um, and other kinds of conditions. And so we had women from 50 to 79, um, as now our participants are, um, some of them are turning 100, um, but it sh the results of the WHI indicated that that idea of being on hormones for the rest of their lives is um, really not going to be um, a good replacement for just general good health. I also want to mention depression in older women. Women are more likely than men to report depressive symptoms. I can't help but bringing out that um, based on um, women's studies research as well as women's health, a lot of the depression um, instruments and the way, particularly in this society, that we um, have norms, uh, maybe gender-related norms, about expressing concerns and issues of depression makes me a little bit um, skeptical that women are dramatically more likely than men um, to be depressed, but they are definitely more likely than men to report depression based on the current assessments that we have available and what sort of is viewed as socially acceptable. Um, to talk about. It's getting better, thank heavens. Um, new onset depression is less common. Um, it's frequently accompanied by other health conditions if depression is new for an older woman. It may be accompanied by anxiety, um, and so a real mixture of emotions. And a key thing when we're looking at depression in older women is to monitor for cardinal signs and symptoms such as low mood, decreased interest in things, and decreased um, energy. You're going to get a, a lecture next um, in the next series on the three um, uh, Ds in older adults, um, dementia, depression, and delirium, and some great tools for being able to assess that. And so I encourage you to take a look um, and, and step in for that lecture. 
Prescription antidepressant use, we see again a much higher percentage of women um, than men who um, are prescribed um, antidepressants and um, I, that um, reflects the higher percentage of women who are diagnosed with depression, but also some health care about wh who's likely to be prescribed these medications. And so just some careful considerations there. Um, this just shows the percentage of people age 51 and over with depressive symptoms, not necessarily a diagnosis of depression, but a report of depressive symptoms. And as you can see, this just sort of shows you a slightly increased um, percentage of women um, than men with depressive symptoms, but it doesn't really change a lot over time as they get older. Um, and I think that's related to the fact that um, it's more new onset depression um, that we might see related to um, clinical conditions as opposed to depression over time changing. So what changes we do see might be slightly new onset and we just don't see as much new onset depression. Okay, so some considerations related to clinical encounters when working with older women. Um, a key thing is to assess for some of the common health conditions that I've mentioned, including those that are underreported. Urinary incontinence, falls, depression, that sort of thing, which um, people might assume um, are just something to be expected as they get older when there's actually um, some important considerations that can be um, evaluated and um, perhaps treated. Um, promote screening and vaccination um, in um, older women, promote a healthy lifestyle, and help them think about, although as I said, it's getting better, but ways that they can get engaged back into society, physical activity, that sort of thing. And maintaining continuity, building on their strengths. Um, the idea that women view their strength as being independent and taking care of others was kind of a profound um, learning for me uh, to realize that that is not only important in their lives, but important in our society. And so build on those strengths at the same time, encouraging them to take care of themselves because they can't take care of others if they're not taking care of themselves. Assessing for underreported health conditions. Um, one of the things that you can do is provide a co comfortable atmosphere for having those kind of discussions. Sometimes our reimbursement for older adults doesn't, isn't so conducive to those careful, comfortable discussions. But thinking about ways to frame some questions about urinary incontinence, falls, um, changes in sexuality, reviewing medications, and this is sort of basic for both men and women, but thinking about those kinds of medications that can impact cognitive function, and then performing exams um, that are appropriate and indicated. This is a, a slide, and I actually, over the last uh, week or two, went through the US Preventive Services Task Force website, went through the American Geriatric Society um, guidance um, and other um, resources to try and get you some of the most up-to-date information about screening for older women, uh, including um, evaluation for unhealthy use of alcohol, evaluating blood pressure, um, bone mineral density, breast cancer screening, cognition, colorectal cancer, uh, cholesterol, lipids, diabetes screening, eye exam, Dental exams, which um, is not really addressed very well in a lot of recommendations that you might see, um, and yet uh, being able to take care of um, our teeth is very, very important, including um, screening for gingivitis. Um, depression, hearing, HIV testing is important, lung cancer, and pap tests. And what I've tried to do on this slide is identify those that are um, the US Pre Preventive Services Task Force has said there's insufficient evidence to recommend screening at this time. Kind of frustrating for those of us in healthcare because we know these are important and we know that addressing some of these issues are important. Thankfully, 
as things stand right now with the Affordable Care Act, there are several of these assessments that the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force says there's insufficient information and yet are still covered like at the annual wellness visit or the initial wellness visit um, that's covered by Medicare. And so um, take a look at this and um, think about uh, incorporating these into your um, screening recommendations with older women. Uh, for vaccinations and immunizations, uh, they, these are not specific to women. Influenza is needed each year, pneumonia once at age 65 or older, um, herpes zoster and uh, DPT, D, TDP um, booster every 10 years. And so then just to finish up with a little bit about healthy lifestyles, that reducing risk by controlling risk factors can be very key um, in, for an older woman's life. In fact, much of the decline that older women experience can just be addressed through modifications like smoking cessation, improved nutrition and maintaining normal body weight, physical activity, and regular checkups. I went to this, um, um, it was at the time Institute of Medicine, but National Academy's Grand Challenges of Aging that was very interesting um, somebody was presenting data on all of the research that's being done to sort of increase longevity. Much of that research is done in animals. But um, he sort of contrasted that research with if we would just address these kinds of modifiable risk factors, we can have so much more of an impact on um, lifespan and life expectancy in older adults. So healthy lifestyle and counseling includes smoking cessation, um, addressing nutrition, physical activity, alcohol misuse if unhealthy alcohol use is um, identified, sexually transmitted infections, and um, screening and vaccinations, as I mentioned earlier. I'm talking about smoking, it, I think it's interesting if you take a look at this slide from 1965, this goes up to 2014, we see a much more dramatic um, decrease in current cigarette smokers for, for men than for women. And, and although it's getting better, um, I'm also aware that um, we were seeing a much more, um, a greater difference in the uptake of cigarette smoking in younger women. And so it's small wonder that we are seeing um, this um, sort of leveling off of cigarette smoking in women. And hopefully, um, if I had the data going out a little bit later, we would see more of a drop off in cigarette smoking in women. But this is another area where healthcare providers, public health campaigns can be very, very important. Eating healthy foods, eat a balanced diet of whole grains, lots of fruit and vegetables and lean proteins. There's all kinds of special diets and hints, the healthy plate, um, the Mediterranean diet. One of the things I just emphasize is, um, to um, older adults and older women is eating a rainbow. Think about eating a rainbow and, and like all likelihood, if you think in that way, you're gonna be getting a um, much more healthy diet. This um, is also addressing the weight control. And so we see that um, the percentage of people age 65 and over with obesity by sex and age groups, um, we don't see dramatic differences in obesity um, for um, men compared to women, but um, it's an issue that needs to be addressed in both age groups. And in particular, since obesity is linked to type two diabetes, um, and type 2 diabetes confers such a greater risk of cardiovascular kinds of concerns for um, older women. This is um, very important to um, address in the, when you're working with older women. Physical activity in daily life is something that's pretty easy. Again, the zoo walkers, I, I love that idea. But at home, housework, gardening, walking pets, um, can be done. Planning outings and vacations with some physical activity, including swimming, joining a recreational club. There's a lot more of that happening nowadays. Renting a rowboat or a canoe or a paddle boat at a lake. 
um, we have paddle boats at Greenlight here in Seattle. And so um, that's a, and I've gone on those things. It's, it's a great workout, let me tell you. But um, those kinds of opportunities can enhance both physical activity as well as um, socialization and fun in an older person's life. Away from home, taking the stairs. Is this all pretty simple and you know this, but just warrants a reminder. Walking instead of calling, I think we now see in our lives a lot of people who are focusing on text messages and emails rather than going you know like down the hall in their house even to connect um, parking in the back of a parking lot and the current recommendation is about 150 minutes per week of moderate aerobic activity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous aerobic activity plus some sort of muscle strengthening about three times a week that's very, very key for balance and minimizing falls. So these are recommendations for older adults. Healthy aging also includes um, maintaining continuity, continuity with um, people, um, one's identity and what's important in one's life and in the environment. So as I think about all of the um, communities that are being set up for older adults, I, I puzzle for myself about whether I want to be in a community that's just older adults or whether I want to be in a community that's multi-generational. And fortunately, there are many more opportunities um, uh, being developed for those kinds of um, situations. Having some realistic expectations for one's health, but not assuming that um, one should um, accept falls, urinary incontinence, and those kinds of things. Stay open to exploring new choices. Find opportunities for personal growth. That can still happen even um, um, as people grow older and finding meaning in life. Um, I know that in my household, my 90-year-old mother is um, finding new meaning with her iPad, and I'm really enjoying those um, connections with family that she can get um, through that and um, so I'm hoping you're finding some opportunities for working both with your family members as well as um, your clients out in the community and I guess that's all um, so I'm I'm pausing here to see where we are with the chat what is the recommendation for someone with a hysterectomy to stay on hormone replacement? Is it based on age? The current recommendation for hormone therapy for women with or without a uterus is really focused on um, management of vasomotor symptoms as opposed to there are other medications now for osteoporosis. Um, so um, the idea that um, hormone therapy or hormone replacement therapy is the answer, really needs to be very carefully considered. Um, it's not a good idea in women with breast cancer. And as I said, the lowest dosage at the shortest duration is the general recommendation for hormone therapy. But there's a lot of research going on. People are looking at bioidentical hormones, um, other kinds of natural plant-based Hormones, the hormones that were studied in the Women's Health Initiative and in many of the other studies were um, animal-based hormones. Um, but at this point in time, if someone were to ask me for a recommendation, I would explore the op options in a person's risk. And only if a person is having moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms would I really sort of point them towards um, hormone therapy. I think it's also interesting that we found out in the Women's Health Initiative that women in their 70s are still experiencing moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms. So it's not something that just goes away after the first five years um, when um, a woman goes through menopause. Other questions in this room or in the audience? They did. Um, so I was just asked, um, didn't they look at um, dementia issues? And although the dementia was sort of a sub-study of the Women's Health Initiative, it was based on a lot of research that initially 
people thought hormones were protective against dementia, and we found actually that there was increased risk. And, and this may have to do with, you know, how choices are made in the research that um, led us to believe it was helpful, who gets diagnosed, who gets, or, or who gets um, prescribed hormones in our society, at least back then, and what hormones are available. Um, but the research would indicate that hormones um, are not a good treatment for dementia either. Other questions, I don't have my hands typing quickly to say get your questions ready. Yeah, Drew? Am I right in thinking there's actually right now two world of vaccines that you get? Yes. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not going to remember the... Um, it does, and um, there's generally a, a vaccine that um, is recommended for older adults, um, if particularly if they haven't had the other one. Um, there's one that's um, viewed as a little bit more um, uh, stronger for older adults and more appropriate, but. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, and the so this was a question. Sorry about the um, pneumonia vaccine. The two part. Are you thinking about the herpes shingles? The new shingles is a two part. Yeah. Um, so here in the room, um, they're talking about the controversy about the pneumonia vaccine um, and the view that for those who had their pneumonia vaccine at a certain age, it's generally recommended that they get the new one. Um, yeah. Right. They just gave me the old one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so he was just saying, give them the old one and come back in a year. But some of that has to do with availability, and the old one is has been more available. Yeah. But no male female differences in that. Everybody should. <laughs> Did you have a question? So um, Christine is um, helping us to remember that the Pneumavax is a two-part series and the Prevnar is one, of, one injection. So thanks, Christine. Any other questions here in the room or outside? I got one more. Oh, okay. It's, it's too complicated, but I, I'm real curious. I always thought Medicaid was for young people who are disabled. Not young, but less than maybe 60 or so, um, yeah, um, I'm being asked that about isn't Medicaid just for younger people who are disabled or um, um, in poverty as opposed to older adults? Is that right? That's sort of what I thought, but I, I, I don't know. Yeah, so the, the issue is that Medicare doesn't cover some things that older adults might need. Like remember, it will only cover about 100 days of long-term care. And so what ends up happening is for long-term care to be covered, um, people generally end up going, having to go to um, an impoverished level in order to qualify for Medicaid in order to get, yeah. And so if we think about older women's lives, and the fact that they're dependent often, at least um, in the past, um, their social security has come from their husband's employment. Um, and if they have social security from their own employment, it is likely a lower um, you know, um, percentage, then um, they're more likely to, to um, go to Medicaid in order to cover um, their health care needs that Medicare does not cover. Did you, a social worker in the audience there? Yeah, so 
So they do call it that when you spin down your assets or whatever. Yeah. yeah, so we're having this discussion in the room. Barbara, the social worker in the room, compared to Barbara, the nurse in the room, um, are, are talking about the fact that um, um, most of the people in long-term care um, end up going on to Medicaid in order to cover their expenses longer term. Um, and a, lot, a higher percentage of those are women. All right, uh, so we're back on our regular schedule next week. And then March 3rd, you'll have a lecture about vision loss. And thanks for your attention and putting up with this sort of sudden scramble and shift in scheduling. Thank you.